Hello and welcome. Back in the summer of 2021, I received and set up this uh, mass spectrometer for accurate analysis and used it in subsequent video, like the dating of the solar system, trace metals and animal bones, and the Great Lakes chemistry and pollution video. I was never able to get the ion chromatograph to communicate with the mass spectrometer correctly for my ICMS project. As good as it is, this instrument has a few drawbacks. Mainly, and for the purpose of this video, it cannot see anything below about 20 atomic mass units or AMU, which is really fine if you don't care about low masses and gases. But I kind of do. So I found this residual gas analyzer on eBay. This is a device designed to analyze the contamination in ultra high vacuum applications demonstrated in the Extreme Laws of Physics video back in December 2020. This device is said to be a standalone analyzer. And if you want to use it as an analytical instrument, you'll have to uh, set up your own injection method. As a side note, similar modules have been used on board space probes for planetary exploration like atmospheres and solar wind composition. The 1976 Viking mission to Mars, the Cassini exploration of Saturn and Titan, and the solar observation SOHO to name a few, all carried a mass spectrometer of some sort. So the RGA is really a small mass spectrometer designed to identify source pollution in the vacuum system and for that purpose, it does not need any sample introduction. In analytical chemistry, the injection method is extremely important and vastly determine the reproductibility, reliability and quality of any analytical instrument. For the most part, I mostly care about qualitative chemistry, so an accurate sample injection system would be overkill. And to accomplish that, I settle for this uh, UHV leak valve this uh, six-way CF2 and three-quarter manifold for the chamber, the Alcatel Annecy turbo vacuum pump and roughing pump and all the same gauge tubing clamps and general equipment you've seen me using in past videos. The leak valve allows for a control leak rate down to 10 to minus 9 torr and is perfect to introduce all kinds of liquid and gases without having to break the vacuum for every sample. The RGA is a macrovision from MKS this uh, model is already over 20 years old, but works just fine. There's many tunable settings to adjust on the software, and it can be hacked to explore up to 300 AMU depending on your quadrupole and sensor size. To calibrate the mass scale, I introduced a small amount of mercury. I looked for it from mass 196 to 204. The isotopic ratio is exactly what you would expect for natural mercury, indicating a good running instrument even at higher mass. So uh, here's a few preliminary results. At about 10 to the minus 6 store, the large peak at mass 18 is the water contribution. Water is especially difficult to get rid of in high vacuum and baking and degassing are the best option for this uh, common problem. The rest is pretty much an isotopic analysis of the air we breathe. Mass 28 is the dinitrogen. Mass 32 is the dioxygen. Mass 40 is the 1% argon. Mass 44 is the carbon dioxide, making up over 400 ppm in the air and still rising. Using the valve to introduce a chemical makes things a bit more interesting. Here I introduce a drop of uh, dichloromethane or DCM and matching the mass spectrum to my library is an easy task. Chlorine has two main isotopes, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 at 75 and 25 percent respectively and always show up in pair that ratio on the spectrum which makes its identification easy. For example, here's a trichloroethylene with additional peaks. The same ratio, two AMU apart, can be seen as long as you use a linear scale. Now, fragmentation happens because molecules can be broken. The mass spectrometer can only work with electrically charged particles and ions, and these ions have a very short lifetime at atmospheric pressure, hence the need for a vacuum. And to create them, we can use a multitude of uh, techniques, like uh, high voltage needles, plasma, lasers, etc. In our case here, we have a set of uh, filament releasing electron continuously like the hot cathode of an x-ray tube. The current passing through the filament can be set in the software. The electrons are accelerated by the bias high voltage, also controllable. Whatever stands in the way of this electron tsunami gets ionized, split, ripped, thrown apart, or out of the above. This intense bombardment results in uh, many fragments of charge and neutral molecules. Now, normally these bits and pieces of molecules are not stable beyond a few microseconds and will recombine quickly. 
But since we are in a vacuum and in an electric field, depending on the polarity settings of the instrument, the positive or negative ions will be accelerated towards the detector at very high speed, too fast to allow any of the unstable fragment to recombine before hitting the detector and generating a signal. And this is how some oddities like a neon oxide plus, argon chloride plus, or single methyl radical can be observed. The uh, noble gas travel alone solo, so there's nothing to split, but uh, they can do something else. Depending on the tuning of the instrument, an argon atom can collect two charges instead of one and masquerade itself as a lighter mass 20 instead of the actual weight of 40. Monitoring these uh, doubly charged species and tuning the system accordingly helps reduce these steps of interference. Now, since we are on a subject, I remember talking about isobaric interferences. As rubidium-87 and strontium-87 are isobaric. Due to isobaric interference with uh, molybdenum, if you remember the fusel project, let's say I wanted to monitor the output of the fusel for deuterium, tritium, and helium-3. The RGA would be the perfect device for that job, but I would probably get a peak at about 2, for mono deuterium and dihydrogen. Another peak at mass 3 for mono tritium or deuterium and hydrogen or helium 3 alone. And another peak at mass 4 for di deuterium or tritium and hydrogen or helium 4 alone. These combinations are example of isobaric interferences. They cannot be separated but you can get a clue from other isotopes and the conditions of operation to get a better idea of what is likely present or absent. But I digress. When it comes to volatile and uh, gases analysis, a few things come to mind. But I wanted to do something interesting and productive. Krypton and xenon are rare gases present in the air at about 1 ppm for krypton and just under 90 part per billion for xenon. Considering the price of these gases has dramatically increased in the past decade, purchasing a tank of either one, even a small one, is absolutely out of the question. So I decided to concentrate them directly from the air and try to detect them. Now my first idea was to run an air compressor through a desiccant to eliminate water, a solution of monoethyl amine to scrub off carbon dioxide, and finally cooling the dry air down to the melting point of krypton at minus 160 degrees below zero. A quick calculation revealed a feasible one cubic meter of air should yield about one milliliters of krypton and it seems like a reasonable prospect. But cooling 1,000 cubic meter down to 100 degrees below zero to collect barely 1 milliliters of xenon is not something I have the time to monitor and my light bill might uh, take a significant hit. So my second idea was to simply pass the dry compressed air through some molecular sieves and activated charcoal and see what would get retained. Now this might seem like the rambling of an obscure nerdy YouTube channel, but it has some real world application in the nuclear industry when treating off gas. Up to 7% of fission product are noble gases. They are difficult to trap and process. Anyway, I let the compressor run for a few hours collecting and analyzing air samples until 340 gallons passed through, or about 1,285 liters. I then recovered the activated charcoal and molecular sieves and heated them to release whatever had accumulated. So Krypton has four stable isotopes, but Krypton-84 is the largest at 56%. The isotopic pattern doesn't lie, so this is a validated detection. I looked for xenon around mass 132, but could not pick up anything. So far, xenon remained elusive. At 18 ppm, neon showed up at mass 20, along with the neon 22 at 10%, which I haven't seen in previous analysis. So a lot of good stuff from uh, this little experiment. And maybe I'll keep it going longer and trying to finally capture xenon. There's many more cool stuff to do with the uh, RGA, and I'm looking forward to read your comments and the suggestions. So, this is probably not your first YouTube video, and you know what to do. Thumbs up if you like it, subscribe if you want, Patreon, bell, share. I hope to see you again on the next one, and thank you for watching. Damn it!